Hello, my name is Anne Marie Cannon, and I'm the host of Armchair Historians. What's your favorite history? Each episode begins with this one question. Our guests come from all walks of life YouTube celebrities, comedians, historians, even neighbors from the small mountain community that I live in. They're people who love history and get really excited about a particular time, place, or person from our distant or not so distant past. The jumping off point is the place where they became curious, then entered the rabbit hole into discovery. Fueled by an unrelenting need to know more, we look at history through the filter of other people's eyes. Armchair Historians is a Belgian Rabbit production. Stay up to date with us through Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Wherever you listen to your podcast, that is where you'll find us. Armchair Historians is an independent commercial free podcast. If you'd like to support the show and keep it ad free, you can buy us a cup of coffee through Ko-fi or you can become a patron through Patreon. Links to both in the episode notes. Okay, everyone, it's time to take a deep cleansing breath. Breathe away the emotional residue of recent national events sink into your body. It's time to give our overtaxed sympathetic nervous systems fight or flight response a break. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that you bury your head in the sand and just forget about all of the important things that are going on in the world today, of which there are many. I'm just asking you to disconnect and join me for the duration of this episode of Armchair Historians. Rather, let us tune up our virtually forgotten in 2020 autonomic nervous system. So here's what I found out. According to LaughterOnlineUniversity.com, breathing is the only function of the autonomic nervous system that can be consciously regulated or changed. It encourages deep diaphragmatic breathing, which stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. This, my friends, is the cooling branch of the sympathetic nervous system. And here's the important part and the reason for this biology lesson. Laughter tends to reduce sympathetic nervous system response activity while engendering softening, expanding, and relaxing parasympathetic nervous system action. COVID pandemic and insurrection aside, I think I speak for each and every one of us when I say we could all use a whole lot more of that. Not only does laughter help prevent sympathetic nervous system activity by assuaging emotional stress, it also helps discharge aggressive negative energy trapped as tension within the body as a result of past sympathetic nervous system overactivity. And yes, I am talking about you 2020 in the past four years for that matter. So with this in mind, I appeal to your sympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic nervous system, Anne-Marie here. You are so awesome and necessary and appreciated. You have gotten us out of some deep shit in the past. But let's face it, you have taken center stage nonstop for most of 2020. And to be quite honest, you could probably use a break. Why don't you move over, quit hogging the spotlight, and give your cousin, autonomic nervous system, a chance to shine? So in an effort to help activate our autonomic nervous systems, I bring you this week's guest, comedian, as well as podcast host and producer, Zach Lyman. Zach has been performing stand-up comedy for over 12 years. In that time, he has been recognized by magazines and shows across the United States. On his cleverly named The Zach Lyman Podcast, Zach sits down with creative guests, to have a fun and laid-back conversation of what they create and why they do it. The Zach Lyman Podcast is a lighthearted show made with passion for comedy, podcasts, and all kinds of art. 
Hi, Zach Lyman. Welcome and thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. Sure. What's your favorite history that we're going to be talking about today? Uh, today we're going to talk about stand-up comedy. Very good. Something I don't know a whole lot. Well, me, I probably do. You'll probably surprise me because I'm, I'm much older than you. So I might know some of the earlier comedians that you talk about. Uh, so go ahead. Give it a go. Tell us about uh, yeah. the history of stand-up comedy. I love stand-up comedy. When we're talking history, a lot of people point towards Mark Twain being like one of the first people that toured and did like an hour of like witty stories on stage. And I'm so familiar with that name. I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's even a whole book about Mark Twain and his tours as a uh, not the term wasn't there yet comedian, but you know, a humorist probably was a more correct way of what they're saying then. I like that point of history about Mark Twain traveling, but I honestly when I think back of when stand up really started is I think of Steve Martin. I was not expecting that one. And for all of those fellow fogies out there like myself, shaking your fists in the air, screaming the words Lenny Bruce or Bob Hope, what about them? They were the first true stand-up comedians. Cool your jets, give Zach a chance. I promise you, Zach ties the pieces together from his perspective as a contemporary stand-up comic of the pivotal role that Steve Martin actually played in ushering in a new era of stand-up comedy. He literally turned the medium on its head, earning his rightful place in history. Trust me, just keep listening. Uh, Steve Martin, it was just perfectly... If you read Born Standing Up, he talks about when he started... There was this weird transition of like, it's no longer a person that goes up between, you know, uh, uh, different kinds of acts at like a lounge between a singer or, a, you know, a juggler or, what, you know, any of those type of things. It was becoming an actual supported art by itself where it had its own clubs and its own venues. And it was this weird transition that Steve Martin lived through and was like one of the first established comedians to be working these clubs. Really? So when did he start? Uh, so he started, I believe, uh, in the early 60s. Oh, I didn't know that. I remember the first thing that when you're talking about Steve Martin is I remember him with the arrow on his head the white mm -hmm. suit. And I remember yeah. a joke about queen of hearts come down and dance with me or for me. And then he takes the queen of hearts and he's like, do, 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 do. Anyways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's my first memory of Steve yeah. Martin. And it's a, it's an interesting, uh, an interesting thought that I was talking about the other day is, so we have prop comedy and we have storytelling and then we have one liner comedians and these are all different types of comedians. But then you look back at Steve Martin, who's like one of the founders of like what we think of stand up today. And he was doing one liners, stories, music, and prop comedy. Oh, yeah, so that's it, it, he so plays banjo. He plays the banjo, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He even has albums that are one half stand up, the other half is banjo. Um, <clears throat> And uh, so you, it, it, it's interesting that he kind of was like, here's all of the tools. And then from there, people are like, oh, I want to do one-liners. I want to do prop comedy. I want to do. And so he's definitely like, I think like a symbol that kind of covers all the types of comedy. Okay. And, uh, and it's interesting that he, he actually started doing comedy in Disneyland when he worked at Disneyland at a very young age age i doing, didn't know that yeah doing magic and selling like magic kits and stuff at disneyland and then that kind of like got the prop comedy side of it going and then it's like let's have jokes around that and then it built from there so you know from what i know about mark twain is 
he's just telling humorous stories and he was very much a writer, which is definitely a side of stand up that I really enjoy. But I really do think of more, more momentum behind Steve Martin being the one of the founders of modern stand up. Oh, because, okay. Because yeah, of, I'm uh, surprised by that choice, but since you've explained it to me, I I can see that, and I didn't realize that he got his start so young because I remember him coming up in the 70s. Hmm. Yeah, and then it's like you, you lead into that, or all any of the guys that came from vaudeville. And then led to doing kind of like TV and stand up and monologues. Uh, you know, th- there's there's tons of uh, different comedians I can think of off the top of my head, um, like Jack Benny. Um, yeah. Uh, and then I get I guess Jack Benny and like his whole crew is kind of like a bunch of classic tapes that I have <laughs> um, uh, of those are uh, the monologue and then getting on TV and doing like the five minutes of an act, you know. What distinguishes the older comedians from this stand-up, this idea of stand-up? Mm-hmm. Well, I, you know, it's like when I think of Jack Benny or anyone in that type of crew, I think of... Uh, like what what is accessible to us now, which is quick YouTube clips of them doing a five minute, you know, little sketch or actor, very very like still almost theater esque mm-hmm. kind of idea, doing some clean comedy ideas, and it's not really like anything that's made into like a club comedy or like a touring like what a touring comedian would be doing, and it's more of that's a art piece that lives on stage. Mm-hmm. somewhere okay. for five minutes yeah. all right anything else about stand-up in the history of stand-up that you want to tell us about yeah i there's so much uh okay. <laughs> there's, there's there's uh so many things that i love about stand-up because uh when i think of like steve martin and then i quickly think of then like the clubs like the improv coming around and how that was one of the first clubs to kind of be established in the u.s where there was multiple improvs across the country and it was like, okay, now we can make these clubs. And then we have like the comedy boom of the eighties, which is kind of a wild time from my understanding. There was more comedy clubs and people wanting to see stand-up comedy than there was comedians. Really? Yeah. So I've heard stories from people that worked in the eighties that sometimes you would walk into a comedy club and you go into the office or green room or whatever the comedians meet. And there would be a wall that has a giant calendar. And then you write your name on a date and you're like, I'm performing October 12th here. And that's how you get easy. Yeah. It was, it was to the point where they're like, yeah, anyone, we just need everyone. So you could lie and say, yeah. I have you, Do you have minutes. a pulse? Oh, forget it. You don't need to have a pulse. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're just like, we'll, we'll take anyone. And and that's why there's, there's so many people that had extraordinary credits in the 80s that were like, yeah, I just, t- I was telling everyone I was a comedian. I was doing these shows. And then, you know, someone's like, oh, you're a comedian. Let's let's have you do these commercials and let's have you do these things. And and so it's kind of like it, it was just like a big comedy boom in general. And there was just so many clubs and everyone was making tons of money, having sold out shows. And then uh, obviously that bubble bursted at a point. But it is crazy. Anytime I hear someone that has worked in uh in the eighties and how quickly they could get gigs or tour and get paid and, and live off of it. And stories. Why about, do like, you think you... that changed? Do you think we lost our sense of humor? <laughs> I don't think we lost our sense of humor. I think it's just kind of like, uh, I think like anything technology wise where it's like, we're really into this thing for a while. And mm-hmm. then all of a sudden we're like, Oh, here's another thing. Like, you know, like TV and, you know, anything we kind of like just move through history but it's interesting because stand up is one of those things that like in the 80s we had this comedy boom everything's for everyone everyone's getting jobs and then you the 90s it kind of like just died out and then early 2000s it was very dead it was very much every club was on life support and then 
again, we had someone like uh, in 2004 or five, I would say, uh, we had someone like Dane Cook come around and then he made it cool again. And so he brought it to MySpace and then he brought it to, uh, you know, being like, I'm at these clubs and start promoting with social media uh, and having like a very cool website and just being, being like the cool guy of comedy. And then all of a sudden stand up was cool again. Yeah, so that's funny. Really it's we, the only thing yeah. that I have on my um in my iTunes that's a comedian is his album. And I still laugh at every every yeah. joke. Yeah. <laughs> every joke. We should be more what? thankful for Dan Cook. <laughs> I guess, you know, and I didn't I learned about him because my daughter, who was a teenager at the time, was listening to him. So I'm an I'm an old fogey because I go back to SNL, you know, in the 70s. And that's where I really got uh, acquainted with uh, comedy, not, yeah. not necessarily stand up comedy, but comedy. Steve Martin was on was in the cast, I mean, he, wasn't he? No, he's hosted. A bazillion uh, over, times. Yeah, like I think he hold like he's one of the people that like hold the record of like most hosting of snl oh, to the point that everyone believes he's on the cast because it's like <laughs> over 30 something times he's well because i can remember reoccurring skits that he did wild and crazy guy yeah um, and then yeah that's an interesting avenue that a point of history too with stand-up is that there's snl was one of the big jobs for people and so uh you know all the people that were doing improv comedy and not really doing stand-up a lot like almost all of them went and did their little like the original cast of SNL it was like the original people doing kind of like improv majorly and then sketch comedy and then they they have this like certain mix at SNL where they're like part we want part improv people we want part stand up people and you know and then we have writers mixed in so and then going through that history of them going to like the 90s and comedy's kind of dying, but SNL's doing great, you know? <laughs> yeah. And yeah, that, right. Yeah. I don't know. SNL had some really shitty years, a lot of shitty years, actually, where it's like I tune in and I, I nah, it's not working for me. So I'm not going to waste yeah. my time on it. <clears throat> well, that's, it, it's really interesting of like, uh, like Adam Sandler and Chris Rock and Chris Farley and a lot of people that are like, I, I grew up with and I really enjoy. It's crazy to me that they were all fired from SNL. Were uh, they? Yeah, and it's and it's very much a time because they were too funny. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they're like, we can't be having this. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's an interesting because you know, at some point there was a meeting where they're like, this just isn't working, even though they have some of the greatest comedians ever. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I didn't know that. <clears throat> yeah. 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 And then so yeah, 2005, we have Dane Cook coming out. And then that's like around the time that I was like, I was already thinking about doing stand-up. I was already, I was, you know, young thinking about doing stand-up. And then uh everyone started listening to Dane Cook and I was like, Yeah, this is definitely what I want to be doing. And there's tons of people that have the similar story of just, you know, that kind of made it brought back comedy clubs and then i think the highest i've seen comedy clubs grow has been in the last couple of years so i think we're kind of getting to that point again where we're like thinking stand-up's cool and it's really like like growing as as possible you know because like well i I'm, i have we, to say that your podcast is the only thing that i've listened to this year that really makes me laugh Oh, thank you. But, but then again, you got to know I'm watching, I'm listening to history podcasts and true <laughs> crime. I love true crime. And that's not a good setup because now like I live in this, this isolated Rocky Mountain town and I'll go for a walk and I'm always <laughs> hearing noises and thinking somebody's following me or something. Yeah, I can't, I can't do that stuff because I feel the same way of like, <laughs> Like uh, I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed. I don't. I am obsessed, and I need to cut it out because it's not psychologically healthy. I need to listen to more funny stuff. Yeah. One of the things I love about your podcast is your laughter. The way you laugh is so genuine, and I don't. I don't even have to know what the joke is, but it makes me laugh. Your laugh <laughs> makes me want to laugh. That's great. <laughs> 
It's true. Do you laugh on stage or are you all, is your uh, no, I, really polished? I, it's very polished. I try to be professional about it. <laughs> and so my podcast is the only thing that I'm like, I really just like, like, especially lately, I've been recording with a lot of my friends. Yeah. And uh, so it's a lot, it feels very like goofy and just in not really inside jokey, but just like very much like, let's make these cheesy jokes and have fun, you know? Yeah. Well, I've really uh, enjoyed them. So I listened to your Eric Escobar episode. Yeah. That was that was good and funny. And um, your friend who's the x-ray technician and model, I listened to part of that. And then I just listened to the one I think that just came out today. When should I get a Netflix series? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was funny. That one made me laugh. Oh, good. So I've been doing this last few weeks, I've been answering questions that I feel like I get asked a lot as a comedian of like, you know, th there's always like the episode you just listened to, there's always a comedian that I meet at an open mic and they've gone on stage three times and then they approach me and they go, okay, how much longer before Netflix calls me? And then I'm like, I don't know. You know, like, <laughs> I'm waiting for that call too, man. How does that it's... work? Because, you know, I did listen to that episode and sometimes these comedians come out and they're like, oh, this person. But of course, I don't have my finger on the pulse of comedy. And then I watch their their Netflix series and I'm like, they're not even funny. Maybe I'm a hard judge, but I don't think I am. <laughs> and And then I feel guilty for them. <laughs> Well, because, because they go out and they do this and it's like, I don't think they're funny. And my the other person I watch him with is my boyfriend. And usually we pretty much agree on that. Like what's funny and what isn't. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I've heard I've heard one story that kind of like opened my eyes. I'm not going to name who the comic is, but I heard about a, a comedian that was good looking and they were at an open mic and they were very new and they're in L.A. and a uh, producer just said, hey, I think you have the right look and kind of the right sound. So if you could just go to open mics for a little bit longer, I'll give you an, an, a, a special. And I don't know if it was for Netflix or for some other company, but I'll give you a special. And then uh, they did that. That's like their entry story is that they're like, great. And then they just went and did some open mics. And then later that year, they filmed their hour that is now, you know, now they're a famous comedian. It's like, <laughs> but I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's more stories just yeah. like that, that kind of are very fitting that way. And then there's tons of comics that, uh, like Eddie Pepitone, he had a special come out on Netflix a few years ago, and it was kind of like under the radar. They didn't promote it on the main page. A lot of like, they didn't put their marketing behind it. And he's very talented and he's been doing it for over 20 years. You know, and he just got his first special. So it's like, you never, you just never know how it works. You how just it never works. know. That's, that's so it could be tomorrow. Like, I, and then I, I'll be like, oh, I just, I actually interviewed that guy. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's like, I had Eric Escobar on the podcast. And then at the end of that episode, he's like, I may or may not be in this TV show. And then two days ago, uh, he was on an NBC show that just aired. That's awesome. How long have you been doing your podcast? Uh, I've been doing my podcast maybe since like 2015 or 16. I also, I had a podcast before that I kind of like jump shift and then jumped into my podcast. So um, what was your podcast it, it, before? It was about comic books and comedy. So we would talk about comic books and comedy and it was just me and another comedian. And it was always like, what are you reading this week, comic book wise? And then like comedy where like, we did a lot of shows together. So then often it would be like, yeah, we went into the show in Indianapolis. What was that like? You know, yeah. so okay. cool. yeah, it, it was a fun, it was a fun show. So, but then so you've been podcasting yeah. since when did you start? Uh, I think we started that in like 2014. So I've been podcasting since like 2014, I'd say. Oh, wow. I feel like we went off the rails and maybe we need to get back to history. Is there anything else about the history that you wanted to share? You know, it's just a stand-up is a topic that I never stop talking about. Uh, <laughs> there's a reason I have a podcast about it. 
<clears throat> but, so is your podcast uh, yeah. about comedy? Would you say that it's about comedy? I, yeah, it's like interview fun. I've had models and actresses and other type of performers, musicians on. And, uh, but at the same time, I'm still joking and laughing with them. And then they'll say something about like what they do. And I'll be like, that reminds me of comedy. And then I <laughs> tell It always goes back to comedy. Yeah. So it's like, cool. I, I never get too far away from it, uh-huh. but, uh, you know, it, it is just, it is just another interview podcast, but, uh, it is very heavily. If you like to laugh, it's like how I like to think. Yeah, of it. I like to, I do like to laugh. I don't know, you know, why I don't watch comedy more or listen to it, but who's your favorite? Okay. Let's get back to the history. Cause I have all these other okay. questions I want to ask you. Yeah. I'll probably edit it back into the conversation about history. I don't know. Do you edit your podcasts or do you, are they just raw? They're pretty raw from my understanding of what people say editing. I do go through and I'll cut maybe uh, ums and uhs or uh, fix some spacing issues. But really, I, I keep it as is and it's pretty basic. And sometimes I don't almost do no, I do no editing at all where I, I realize me and the guests barely said um and uh and I go, yep. Pretty good. (laughs) (laughs) I know I'm obsessed with us and ums. Yeah, interesting. So let's get back to history. I keep saying we're going to do that, and then we go off on another (laughs) tangent. (laughs) I still want to know more about that. Uh, Anyways, I always like to know how other podcasters do do things. Yeah, yeah, I'm always interested in that too. I um, so if you want me to go back history of of comedy another interesting topic that i love covering is just the venues themselves and how that's kind of changed over time because we have like i said earlier improv the improv like in arizona i have the tempe improv and the tempe improv has its own interesting history of being built with the mindset of people can film their specials there so like david spade in the early 90s filmed his special there and it's changed and they've remodeled, but they had the spacing and areas so they could set up the giant cameras that were needed for that and have like, you know, the cranes and all, all that inside. So it's very nice and very well done. Uh, te- the Tempe Improv. Love that club. I love performing there. Always a good time. But then there's many of other clubs like. I don't know so much of the history about, but like Go Bananas is another interesting club because it's an interesting name, Go Bananas. Go Bananas. And then in, I think it's Indianapolis and around there in that part of the country, there was tons of Go Bananas from my understanding was there was like a Go Bananas on every corner. And then slowly it's cut back to like a handful now. Have you Um, performed at a Go Bananas? Yeah, I performed as like a guest spot but I've never like headlined a go bananas. It's on my to-do list is really, (laughs) there's many interesting comedy club names that I'm like, I have to add that to the resume. (laughs) Okay. I need, I need these on my resume. So (laughs) how we think of it in standup world is that's club comedy, right? So there's a club comic and that term really probably came out of the eighties is like, everyone's doing all these clubs and being like, you know, the whole blazer with the sleeves rolled up talking, you know, talking about airline food type of I'm just I'm just doing the gig type of comedy that everyone was like a- able to do. And then in the 90s is when alt comedy came around. And my understanding of alt comedy, because this is also a, a topic where people go, where, where did that really start? And what's the real meaning behind? But my understanding of alt comedy is it's alternative venues to comedy clubs. That's where people were going, where they're like, my jokes about real life and depression or any, you know, anything that's like real or extremely odd, you know, anything that's not in the normal club comedy world that just didn't seem to hit hard, they would be performing at like a Chinese restaurant or, uh, you know, a coffee shop or something, you know. Do you have an example of somebody I would know that does alt comedy or did alt comedy? Yeah. One of the uh, founding fathers is, uh, I think he hates this term, but a lot of people use Mark Marin 
who does the W2F podcast, one of the founding fathers, or Pat Oswalt is a very good one that started kind of alt comedy world. Eugene Merman is one of the kind of doing one of those things. So there's, you know, Eugene's later, I think, and Patton's pretty early. But Mark Marin is often credited as one of the comics we can kind of go to of in New York doing Luna Lounge, which was maybe a Chinese restaurant, loungy kind of thing. From my understanding, never been there. I don't think the place exists anymore. But in the early 90s, that was kind of like the open mic they would go to on like a Tuesday or something and work out things that just didn't hit hard at clubs. And so there's a lot of comics that are like, what are you? Are you an alt comic? Are you a club comic? And like, where do you fall? And it's so funny that it could be that black and white, but also, you know, there's people like Mark Marin that were working the clubs, but also doing alt comedy. And he's kind of like a good, you know, someone that kind of made it doing both. And so it's always interesting to me of the alternative clubs. And that's something that I'm really into is being a DIY comic and more of booking it yourself. DIY comic. What does that mean? I use that term for, because I don't have like a manager. I don't have a booker. I don't have, I don't have anyone helping me except for me. Mm -hmm. And I learned how I wanted to book shows and do things from my friends that were in bands. So I took what they were doing in bands and then I applied it to comedy. So I was calling the, the music venues and asking how much is it for me to just rent it out for a night or can we work a ticket deal or you know, just like different angles I could perform and bring my own audience instead of relying on the club to bring their audience. Because when you do clubs, there's comics that do clubs and they headline and they have a good relationship with a, a certain company. Maybe it's the improvs, maybe it's a Go Bananas. And they are like, okay, we love David and we love David so much. Let's have him tour the country. And so they move them to all the different clubs that they own, or maybe they're part owners of, or maybe they book for. So you can kind of get in these circuits, you know, and you can kind of get into the world of like jumping around and being really well connected. But that relationship is very like old school, how things kind of worked in the 80s and 90s is uh, you set up chairs, you be around, you be a good person, you go pick up the headliner from the the airport, you know, you're just around. And then through time, you know, first year you're hosting and the next year you're featuring and then slowly you're headlining, you know, that's kind of how it works out in that realm or it used to, but that's not so true anymore because you have people that get their fame from social media or you get their fame in other ways than just originally stand up. And then it's like, well, how does that work for them? You know, they need venues and sure they can just call a comedy club and then maybe get into the circuit and kind of skip all those steps or they can call a music venue and they could just rent out a music venue and then they get to keep all of the money, you know? So it's, It's very interesting of how comedy has changed that way, where it's no longer gate kept by uh, clubs. A lot of things are like that. A lot of things are like that. Yeah. And so it's no longer about relationships always with comedy clubs, but I think it is important that you, especially like your local comedy club, being like a good relationship with them, because where are you going to go on a Tuesday or a Wednesday or, you know, when you don't have a music venue rented out, you know, where are you going to hang out and be around and see good comedians? Um, so it's, it, it, it's interesting that way. And that's kind of like where I've fallen into with my career of just going towards booking music venues and booking my own thing, but also continuing to build relationships here and there. And, you know, just calling the go bananas every once in a while and being like, Hey, I'm Zach, you know, this is your profession. You are a stand up comedian. Yeah. Yeah. In 2020, I've been saying retired, but yeah. (laughs) Uh, How has that been working out with COVID? (laughs) Well, it hasn't. Uh, (laughs) uh, That's why I'm doing a podcast because I'm a tour guide. That's what I do. I have a tour business. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been, there's Zoom shows, people doing it on Zoom, doing Facebook shows, you know, all virtual versions which is very, I, I hear sometimes it, it you know, it, it can pay well if it's put together well, but it's kind of like one of those things again, where it's like a new territory. And I was, I was very shy to get into that realm, 
because I'm very, I'm loud, I'm active on stage. And I was very unsure if I, that's what I wanted my neighbors to be hearing. <laughs> you know? It's like me, me for 45 minutes yelling about something. But <laughs> so you haven't done any of that? You haven't done any? Uh, I've done, I've done, uh, I did one officially and then I popped into like an open mic and like did like a five minute, but I did one book show where it was promoted and, and I did, I don't know, like 12 or 15 minutes or something of material. And I thought I'd ease my way in with like 12 minutes. And, uh, but it is interesting because I've been asked to do shows that are hosted in Tokyo, you know? So it's like a new realm of like, yeah, is this, but immediately my mind is with this new world of like, uh, I'm always thinking of like my bookings and traveling and how, you know, trying to build relationships. I'm like, that's great. You know, I can make relationships in other countries now with these online shows. Sure. But then there was a point where I haven't done stand up in eight months. So I'm like, do I really want people in Tokyo to see me very rusty trying to remember my jokes being like, I don't know. I thought I knew where this joke was going. I don't, you know, like, do I want, there you go. This guy isn't very good. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you should stick to podcasting. <laughs> well, you always have podcasting, but do you make money on podcasting? Right now? No, I'm not, I'm not really trying to make money this year with podcasting. In the past, I've done like the affiliate links and having sponsorships and stuff. And, uh, you know, my podcast has been very up and down because I started it when my comedy career wasn't really super busy. I was still doing like a part time job here and there. And then since I started to now is like so different, you know, not only like just money wise, but also just like how busy I am with comedy. And so my podcast really shows that of like anytime I have a break from stand up, it's like I podcast and then as soon as like I'm on tour, it's like you don't hear from I me. I noticed for, like, that. Two months. I was looking at how often I was going to ask you how often you drop a new episode. It varies, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Now I'm being this year has been very like I've been I've posted this year more than ever, and that was even before before lockdown or anything like that. And then year last year was me getting back into it. So I eased my way back in last year. Okay. And then this year I was like, really like, yeah, I want to be more consistent. And I was like, even if it's just one episode a month, that's great. But now I'm trying to do like maybe a, an episode or two or a week. And I'm trying to push it at that, at least that numbers and making it more easy on myself of like what I do and how I book and stuff like that. Because because last year uh, was a big thing for my podcast. We got into the top 80 on iTunes. I saw that. That's awesome. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank in you. Comedy. In comedy, yeah. right? Yeah, which is like one of the hardest <laughs> sections to grow in. And it was kind of, it took me, it shocked me because a week before I was number 200 and then I was in 80, you know? What do you use to interview people? What uh, platform? Uh, recently I just been using zoom mostly. Okay. How does that work out for you? It's good because, uh, every, it, this year, everyone works from home. Uh, so everyone knows how to use zoom. So it's, that's really the, the, the turning point for me on it was using zoom because I'm like, yeah, the guest knows how to use zoom. So that's true. That's yeah. true. And the quality just, is like, all right. So did you used to do live interviews? So when my podcast took off and I, I got into the top 80, I was like, okay, this is the moment that I will go and rent a studio. And then I went and looked at studios and then I found a space that I turned into a studio. And then I had a studio set up. And then right when I was like really about to like get into that is like when lockdown happened. So I was like, oh, I have this wonderful space I don't get to use. Um, oh, no. Did you have a lease but, on it? Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, they are wonderful. And oh, okay. uh, I share the place with other people. So it's like, not nah, it didn't ruin me or anything like that. It didn't ruin my <laughs> life. Or, you know, it, well, it was that's like, a relief. Yeah, it's more of a bummer of like, I was like, oh, I, you know, because I wanted to set it up when I have my friends in town, when they're like, headline the the comedy club they can come over and promote it at the podcast studio you know yeah. 
And so that was kind of like the thing I wanted to lead into and just getting more set up and making it easier on myself. I did do a lot of in-person interviews, but I, from even from the beginning, I've kind of done them over the internet also, because when my comedy career was nothing and my podcast was nothing, how do you get a guest on the show? You, you, you make it as easy as possible. And you go, Hey, look, you don't even have to, you don't even have to get up. You could just sit right there. <laughs> yeah. Just how long do you want the episode to be? 10 minutes? That's fine. We'll do this for 10 minutes. Yeah. And that's how I convinced people that were way more famous than me to come on and talk. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. It's I, I That's how my podcast is too. It's like these questions I've been answering, they're almost like comedy 101 questions. Interesting questions that I know people are almost scared to ask sometimes. Like, when do I get a Netflix special? And <laughs> uh, But then again, I'm answering them with my best friend, Lou. And I'm like, yeah, you got nothing going on. <laughs> yeah, you're free. Yeah. You know, you, he's, done, he's done comedy for over four years. And I'm like, you get it. You know the answers. What would you like people to remember about this history? I think that it's uh, something that I really hope people take away from the history of stand-up is the ups and downs of it. That it's forever changing and how when things seem like it's completely over and clubs are shutting the doors, they pivoted or something happened in the world or, you know, as people, we just changed and then it came back. And so that's very interesting to me of, you know, even right now where like there's comedy clubs shutting their doors and then in the next following year, we could go right back to maybe comedy's booming. It's, it, it's just such an up and down, but very interesting. And, uh, and every time it comes back, it's always better and it's always more, uh, more of like what I love and what I see. So I, I think that's why I want people to take away from it. It's just the ups and downs. Cool. Your podcast, that platform, has that helped you in your uh, comedy and doing stand up and booking gigs and that type of thing? Yeah, but probably not in the way people think. What people think is probably, you know, that I, I have some listeners and then they come out to shows and buy tickets and in that version. But uh, it's not really that. I think the way my podcast has helped me the most is a lot of guests that have been on the show have been people that I've known in life or have met in life in some way. You know, I've either been around them or I was involved in like some photo shoot with them or some kind of, you know, just like not always comedy related. And I was talking to them and I go, you know what? I would love to just chat with you about what you do on the podcast. And so it really helped me kind of build those friendships and connections that way. And then also I've reached out to people that I really wish I could pick their brain and really get to know like how they do comedy. You know, like when I had Brian Kiley on, who's a writer for Conan, uh, clearly I was just like, how does that happen? And like, <laughs> what's that life like? Like, I yeah. that's so different than what I'm doing. And uh, so it's, I'm often trying to get guests like that. And, and it's really helped me build friendships of people being like, yeah, Zach's a great guy. Of course, I'd love him to do this thing. And maybe, maybe I've gotten gigs that way. And I, it's sure, but really, I've personally have grown a lot and helped me in comedy of like, oh, this is the approach I should take for this. Even when I've had musicians on or models or whatever, they're like, yeah, this is how I grew my Instagram. And I go, oh, great. I should be doing that, you know, or any of those type of things. So yeah, my, my podcast has really helped me a lot. Yeah, I like doing the podcast. I started doing it because of COVID. I've been thinking about doing this. I've had this idea of talking to people about history for years. So yeah, I really like it. I wish I could get paid big bucks for doing it and that's not going to happen <laughs> you don't <laughs> so know I, that I, I do I feel like I found my niche that, and, and it's like so what do you do now <laughs> hopefully I'll be able to open my business again next year but I'm afraid of the COVID and people were open this year I live in a, a tourist town and people some of the tourist sites were open but I just yeah. have you done any stand-up have you yeah, I did. Um, at the beginning of November, uh, I thought the number the numbers were very low and it was very safe 
where I was doing it. Like they were doing like they were scanning the heads doing the heat thing and everyone had to wear a mask and like the the moment anyone's not wearing a mask they like definitely had to leave so it was like and they're like spraying down the place so i was like okay there this is the safest place to do it and so i i did a couple of shows at the beginning of the month and then i'm constantly kind of paying attention to like the numbers and how things are going right and quickly after that uh, impossible for me to go out so (laughs) it was it, it was for a, a slight moment. It was the first time I've done stand up in like nine months. And uh, uh, that must have been so weird, though, with all those, uh, you know, things that they have to do to keep people safe. And yeah, it, it's definitely, it does change because, like, it's as, like, there's so much that goes behind a stand up show. Something like even the temperature of the room, like, if the AC is too cold or it's too hot people are slightly uncomfortable that stops them from laughing so much, you know? So it's not like a roaring laugh, like, like you want in a comedy club. Yeah. Um, So it's like stuff like that, like really does. I was really thinking about that too, of like, are these people comfortable wearing the masks? Are they comfortable sitting with other people? And so, and I had all these anxieties about it myself and I was like, okay, they're not going to be so comfortable, but there, I felt like, uh, at least when I, when I headlined, it was like very safe and comfortable and, and it, it went really well. But at the same time, I, I felt like it, it was a little, yeah, we're, we're enjoying this. And then uh, they might have a slight thought of like, oh, yeah, you know, someone sneezed we could die something. because we came to his show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, it was. um, Yeah, I, I was, you know, it, it's something like that. Like, I never want to promote people gathering <laughs> so i was like i was like yeah i was like yeah we're doing this safe and it was that's like, right that's right it was I like guess. it was like a third capacity type of thing and it was just so i've been really picky about when i see because i get asked to do shows all the time even when it's like in because i'm in arizona and we uh you know we just we just let it roll you know we're just <laughs> we're just we're just free out here being like, yeah, we're, we're never shutting down, you know? So, uh, so well, like, we're, even not, in like, we're not in Colorado, but the numbers are really bad. Our governor and his husband have it. Oh, they geez. were just, and he was like the poster child for wear a fucking mask all the time, <laughs> every day. I want to yeah. know how he got it, but yeah, I never know. Yeah. And so it's, it's, uh, it, yeah, I've, I've been very cautious and, and uh, as soon as the numbers like just went right back up here, I was just like, yeah, no. And I'm I'm just waiting it out. And I'm totally OK if I'm not doing stand up until next summer. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. It does seem like it's coming. I think, you know, obviously we have to be really careful this winter. Yeah. 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 And yeah, hopefully the vaccine and hopefully we can figure out a, a good way to handle this but for comedy right now i feel like everything's virtual and i'm like you know what i'll just focus on the podcast and stand up will come back at some point you know this is the longest break in 12 years that i've ever not done stand up uh but it you know i'm like that's you know it, it will it's a forever thing in my life so as long as i'm alive and healthy i'll be doing it so so hopefully we can get back to it next year so how did you get into stand-up? When did you decide, oh, I'm funny, I'm going to be a comedian? There was a point. I was going to say I, I didn't think I was funny, but I guess there was a, a delirium. Or a <laughs> uh, I really got into stand-up comedy when I was 14, watching it and being like, and, and watching comedy specials. And then I was working at a coffee shop. I want to say when I was 17 or 18, I was working at a coffee shop and the owner was like, I want to have an open mic night, but like a variety show open mic night. And he's like, I want to have people breathing fire, juggling musicians and comedians. And I was like, okay, cool. And he's like, I want you to host it. And I was like, all right, I'll I'll do that. So he told me to write material for that. And uh, it was kind of like, I finally got permission to do it because I've always, I wanted to do it for so long. So I was 17 or 18 when I started and I, uh, and I did mostly like coffee shops until someone was like, Hey, you know, there's like comedy clubs for this. And I was like, well, yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> so then I, I kind of got introduced to like that late, like when I was like 20, 
19, 20, and 21 is like when I started kind of like popping into clubs and stuff. So, so were you just doing like stand up at coffee shops or? Yeah, I was going to like, like what they were just open mics and they would write, anyone can perform, you know, poetry, whatever. And then I would show up and I would be <laughs> the only stand up. And I would be in so often. And uh, uh, oddly enough, it like it, it helped my career in weird ways now but like it also like stunted my career like all these comics that starting now there's so many open mics and so many ways to kind of like they can just go on facebook and find an open mic for comedians and they can immediately meet comedians and comics can give them advice and stuff i was the only comedian so no one ever gave me advice for like the first couple of years of me doing stand-up but uh yeah it was it was just me and a bunch of musicians and everyone <laughs> hate everyone hated it <laughs> No, certainly that's not true. You kept doing it. You must have gotten something out of it. Well, music music is a thing that you can have at your restaurant and it can be playing in the background and people can hold conversations. A stand-up comedian uh, into a microphone is not a thing you can have at your restaurant <laughs> <laughs> when people want to carry community, like have conversations. So it's very much like, they didn't realize what they did by putting that on the flyer or they're like, anyone can perform. They're like, oh, well, you know, you, had, you kept at it. You yeah. kept at it. And it's, this is reminding me of a couple things. So when I went to grad school, I was studying writing and what I always say I got out of it was a tough skin because, because <laughs> everybody's a fucking critic. Everyone's a critic. And if you can, yeah. you know, deal with, that if you can deal with going into a Chinese restaurant and nobody's paying attention to you and you keep telling yeah. your jokes anyways. So that's one thing that it reminds me of. And then the other thing is Tom Waits. You know who Tom Waits is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. An interview he did a long time ago, he said, you know, I, I was never a busker, but in some ways I wish I would have been because I would have developed that thick skin. So... Mm. You know, I mean, I, I imagine anybody who's starting out in comedy, that's, that's, that's gotta be like terrifying, but yeah, yeah. what is it about comedy? I, I was talking to my friend Veronica a couple days ago mm -hmm. and I felt like I was on, I was a comedian, she was laughing and I know that felt really good, you know, to be able to have the timing or whatever. I'm not that yeah. funny though, but when she laughs, it feels like so edifying to me. Mm. Is that what it is for you? I think partly I always I, I try to like think about this very often. Um, I think partly it's that where it's the enjoyment and the the rush. But like you kind of comparing like putting the two things you said together is when you do these open mics, even now you do these open mics and stuff, there might not be an audience. And I always call it performing for chairs. Um, <laughs> and so you kind of are like, you know, if you're just living off of that high of making people laugh, that that's not always there. Or maybe maybe I've kind of like grown to understand that more. But it's like, yeah, of course, like when you're at a, a club and it's full and it's like that laughter, there's like it's amazing. And you're like, this is what I worked for. But I think a lot of it for me is also I love the writing of the joke. I love figuring out the puzzle of like, I had this really strange idea. Now I have to convince these strangers that it's funny or like that it's interesting or anything, you know? So, so it's the puzzle of that. And I also think I love what keeps me going in stand up is that it's a thing that never ends. I, I can never conquer it, you know? And cause I am very much a person that like picks up a hobby and then I go, yeah, I get it. And as soon as I say I get it, it's over. Like I'm like, if I'm reading a book or anything, go, yeah, I know where this is going. It, I'm, I'm out, you know. <laughs> and with stand up, you're like, I, you can have the strangest idea. You can hear it on the podcast many times. People talk about, I have a joke that's a, about a CD changer, and it's, it's mentioned in many episodes <laughs> where. Uh, I'm doing an impression on stage of a CD changer and I'm rolling around on the ground and I'm making all these weird noises. And uh, that came out of me just being like, I was on tour with other comedians and it was almost like a bet where I was like, I bet you I can make people laugh with the weirdest idea. And I love that joke and I love doing that joke. 
it's a joke that I don't do all the time, but um, it, it's back to that of like, I took this crazy idea and then I go, I got you. I convinced you this is a great idea. So I, I think that's what, what probably keeps me going in stand up. Interesting. See, interesting. Wow. I'll cut that out. I don't know. Sometimes <laughs> I don't. Sometimes I keep it in there so that people know that I'm really in the conversation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that like is. I hear, that, my, I hear myself all the time go, yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. I like, get it. Like, yeah, I'm like stoked. I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, it's funny because when I go back, I always dread doing the doing the edit because I'm afraid of what I said <laughs> or what I did. I cut a lot out of a lot of my commentary out of my episodes because mm. I think, Oh, that sounds stupid. Why did I say that? Ah, I'll cut that whole thing out. <laughs> so, but this is great. I wanted to ask you if you could do anything and get paid for it, what would it be? Oh man. I think if I could do anything, and get paid for it, it would be just doing stand up, just traveling, telling jokes I think that is like every time I do travel and I, I get paid doing it, I feel like I, I robbed a bank or something. I'm like, people wow. let me do this. <laughs> like <laughs> every time I go on tour, I go, you know, <laughs> I'm like watching this could end at any moment because I, I convinced these people. <laughs> so you've been there, you've you've done that. That's awesome. That was a dream and you're doing it. Yeah, that is that is the dream. Then and then uh the every year it's like a little more uh a little more better and a little more comfortable. You know, when I first started touring, it was sleeping on people's couches and breaking even was the goal on going on tour, you know, that you rented a theater and the theater cost $200 and hopefully you sold enough tickets to cover that and just moving and paying for gas and stuff. And that was the goal. And now it's like, oh, okay, I can actually come home with a little bit of money and hopefully pay rent with, uh, with the touring. So t tell me about how do you do, how would you describe your your comedy? Ooh, uh, that's one that I've been really struggling with because uh, I don't think I sound like anyone else. I very much have my own way of telling jokes and very found my own voice. Um, but it, it I often have stories and one liners, and it's very I. Well, you know, we just did an episode about being clean on my podcast. And uh, somehow over these years, I've kind of become more and more of a clean comic. And, oh, really? Yeah. And I think that's just like a growth thing as a person. When you um, say clean, you mean you don't swear and. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, the years ago was the first time I got booked on a show and I go, why did I get booked on this show? Like it was like a random, like they really wanted me. And then they were like, because you're a clean comic and like oh, everyone okay. else on the show is clean. And then since then I've done like churches and I've done, you know, other clean and, and, and booked corporate gigs and stuff that are clean. And it's funny because it's not like a goal of mine. <laughs> to do it. Like it wasn't like a, a thing I was pursuing. It just kind of happened. Like I used to be more vulgar as a person and on stage and i think a lot of that's like probably shock value kind of laughter that i was hoping to get like a cheap laugh off of and then i just kind of like started writing more and more stories and it's like well i want to get my point across i want to spend so much time on being so vulgar so i fall more into the clean comedy side and i definitely fall on the side of uh storytelling and alt comedy so oh so you do alt comedy Okay. Yeah, a lot I, of I have to say, there. I haven't really listened. It, where can I find your stand up? Can, do you have YouTube videos or something? Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff on my Instagram, and there's a lot okay. there's some stuff on YouTube. Tell us about your podcast. Yeah, so I've had my podcast for a while, and it's just interview style. And when I pitch it to people that I want on the show, the, what I say is it's a laid back interview where we discuss what you're doing or what I find, what part I find interesting of what you're doing. And really it's often tell me about your, your creative skill or creative outlet that you do. I've had uh, models, actresses, musicians, uh, 
yoga instructors, um, you know, spiritual guides. I've, I've had almost every type of person because I, it's usually I meet the person or I, I've seen something they've done and I go, wow, I really want to dig deeper on this. And I really have a lot of questions because I'm right. a very curious person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I, that's why I pick the people I pick. Even my neighbors, if I, I mean, I say that, like, even if I ask somebody in town here, it's usually because they have an intriguing story that I want to know more about. So, and I think that's what makes a show good is because you're passionate about it. You're curious. Yeah. Okay. So I know this is a tough commitment. It's not a hard commitment, but okay. I want you to think about it and don't feel like you betrayed somebody by saying the answer that you say, but who's your favorite comedian? Uh, can I give you a top five? Yeah, give me a top five. Okay, that I feel you that's feel more better. Yeah, because it's just like, uh, I feel like it's the same of like, what's your favorite music versus what are you listening to right now? Those are very different things, you know, because okay. like Steve Martin is the reason I do stand up comedy. You know, I saw I saw him as a as a child and I was like, I, I, that's amazing that he just gets to be goofy up there. Um, so like, and I still love, and I listen to Steve Martin from time to time. And I own all of his vinyls, but then there's, there's people like, uh, Mike Birbiglia who oh, has okay. a handful of specials on Netflix and his, uh, special, thank God for jokes. I've seen hundreds of times. Uh, it's a thing that I used to just have it saved on my iPad <laughs> And I would just every time I was traveling, I'll just put it on, you know. So he's the one who had the uh, who has a sleeping disorder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sleepwalk with me is a movie oh he has about God. his sleep sleeping that was, disorder. And, that was shocking and funny all at, yeah. all at the same time. I didn't see the movie, but I've listened to his uh, stand up about that. Yeah, yeah, and then. Eddie Pepitone is a big one that kind of like introduced me to the idea of like different kinds of comedy and being like very alt comedy, um, you know, and then John Mulaney is a very loved and adored comedian that's very old school comedy. I, I saw Dusty Slay do five minutes on like late night and it just blew my mind. And I was like, this is so good. And then I went and saw him when he came to town and he did an hour that was just amazing. There, there's just so many that I really love. <laughs> it's hard. Do you think that this pandemic is funny? Uh, it's very hard for me to find the funny in the pandemic. But um, I've watched some comedians come up with some really good material about it, about what we're watching, what we're doing. And, and so it's, it's one of those, uh, I'm struggling with making jokes about the pandemic or I'm struggling with finding the funny in, in that right now. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's, it, it's, I feel like I'm also that type of person of, I, I need to get through the experience before I can really go, ah, that was funny when I watched every episode of Supergirl on Netflix for a month. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez, I know. I keep running out of shit to watch. <laughs> yeah. I really enjoyed talking to you. And uh, have you uh, had gigs in Colorado? Yeah, I've done Denver before. Um, and then I did outside of Denver, but the last time I was there was just in Denver. Oh, so. okay. Well, I'll definitely look for you. If you come to Denver, I'll definitely come and see you. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, good luck uh, weathering out the rest of the pandemic. And thank you. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Okay. I'm take... looking forward to seeing the episode. So thank oh, you. Oh, yeah, it'll be about three weeks. Okay, awesome. I'll see you All then. Right. Okay, bye. There you have it. Stand-up comedian Zach Lyman and the cleverly named Zach Lyman Podcast. Do yourself a favor and add his podcast to your podcast queue. 
And be sure to check out our episode notes on where to find Zach and more about some of the comedians that he referenced in the interview. Also, I'd like to ask if you haven't done so already, please follow us, like us, leave us reviews, whatever you can do on social media and wherever you listen to your podcasts. It would really help armchair historians. And just remember, sometimes you just have to take a break from all the bad news. Thanks for listening and have a great week.